All right. Well, I'd like to um, welcome everybody to today's webinar from the uh, Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC. Um, many of you know me by now, but my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Uh, today's present presenter is going to be Dr. Brad Clark, who I will introduce in a few minutes uh, before we begin a, um, a few comments. Um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. However, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation by entering them through the Q&A or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. I'll be monitoring the questions, and the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll try as best we can to answer all the questions uh, today. Um, the most common question is about getting copies of the slides, and yes, copies of the slides uh, will be available afterwards. If you'd like a copy, uh, please send me a request. Uh, my email address, tmcgiven at quantarian.com, is there on the screen, so please send me a request. I'll, also, we're recording this, um, this webinar, and uh, shortly afterwards, the video audio will be posted, and we will distribute a link once it is posted. Um, today, to begin today's presentation, uh, let me give a brief sort of commercial overview about uh, the SISI Act. Uh, first of all, as I said before, please note my email address for any follow-up. Uh, but the SISI Act is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated. That's who I work for and is funded through the Department of Defense's Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, the SISI Act is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for the technical areas of information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management for DTIC. Uh, please be sure to check out our website and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Uh, we've also got two, I've also got two uh, discussion groups on LinkedIn going, uh, one called CISIAC Software Intensive Systems and the other one called CISIAC Info Information Assurance. Um, so that's the, the introduction. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Brad Clark is Vice President of Software Metrics Incorporated, a Virginia-based consulting firm. Um, I, I've known Brad for a few years now, and his area of expertise is in software cost and scheduled data collection, analysis, and modeling. Uh, he works with clients to set up their estimation capability for use in planning and managing. He's also helped clients with software cost and schedule feasibility analysis and cost estimation training. Uh, Brad, Brad, Brad received his master's in software engineering in 90, 1995 and PhD in computer science in 97 from USC. Uh, he's a co-author of the most widely used software cost estimation model in the world, Kokomo 2, which estimates the effort and duration required to complete a software development project. So, so now I'll, um, I'll mute my phone and I'll turn the presentation over to Brad. So welcome, Brad. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And today uh, we're going to talk about a, a metrics uh, manual that was created under uh, funding from a uh, couple of DOD uh, agencies. And the manual, there's a hard copy available, a version available, which you'll see in the presentation how to download, as well as this online wiki version. Uh, that's what I'm going to take you to today. We're going to see, uh, just kind of overview what the manual, what's in the manual, but also look at some of the results, some of the things that we did uh, to actually create cost estimating relationships from data, uh, which is something that uh, everyone can do with their own data at their own organization. So this is a little bit of a um, trail map so you uh, will recommend to you steps to take to create your own local set of cost estimate relationships. So now, um, all right, the topics today, just do a quick overview. Uh, this will be uh, uh, during the demo, I'll do an overview. We'll talk about data collection. That'll be pretty short. Uh, metrics definitions, very fundamental to creating uh, cost estimation relationships. Uh, data assessment, you know, once you, once you get data, you need to compare what you have to your, your definitions and find a way to normalize the data to your definition so that you get apples to apples uh, type comparisons. I'll then uh, discuss what we found, uh, the results from our investigation into this uh, the data pile that we analyzed. 
Um, Barry Bain uh, also contributed a special chapter on S Bain challenges. We'll just take a look at that. That's an interesting read. And then we want to talk about manual review and adjudication, which actually I'll talk about here in a few seconds, uh, but there's a way to do that. Uh, if, uh, so this basically is uh, uh, myself, Brad Clark, and another uh, person, Dr. Ray Madike, who works at NPS. And we both are graduate students at USC um, back in the late 90s. And uh, we both now are the editors of this wiki, wiki and we'd like to actually uh, improve it. The version right now is uh, 0.75, uh, and that's the URL for it. I'll, sh I'll show that URL to you uh, again in a bigger font. But softwarecost.org is the, uh, the URL of the wiki, which we're going to be going to in a second, well, in a minute. So the, the software cost estimation metrics manual is an example of basically identifying data to collect for cost estimation, uh, defining the data, uh, preparing data for analysis by comparing your data definitions to what has been collected, uh, analyzing data to derive uh, productivity benchmarks or cost estimating relationships, which are uh, very small models, and the manual concludes uh, with a future a look at future challenges at estimation. Uh, all the content's available uh, online uh, in a searchable format. It's a, it's a wiki, so there's a search box up there. You can look for things. Uh, the URL is presented here. It's uh, softwarecost.org. Uh, the presentation, uh, this, this presentation takes a live tour of the online uh, manual, and you can access it through a web browser. Uh, I know some of you may be behind firewalls and things. That there's nothing we can do about that. But um, in general, there's, you know, there's everything on this website is suitable for work, and it shouldn't be any blacklists, uh, as far as I know. I mean, I've never thought that there's anything controversial about cost estimating uh, data and equations. But anyway, that's our website. And uh, we also are advocating or, or um, asking for people to review the manual uh, and so we can improve it. So we're asking people to, to review, comment on the metrics manual, we respond to comments uh, on the wiki within 30 days. We'll send you an email alerting you to the, the adjudication that, that uh, we've done something about your comment or we're not going to do anything about the comment for a certain reason. Uh, the way that you submit comments to is you, you, know, you quote the, the section in the wiki where you found uh, the the error, or the mistake, or or the the place for improvement, or the where you think something's missing, and you send it to info i n f o at softwarecost.org. The manual the manual is currently at version 0.75. Um, what we'll do is we will update the manual based on your feedback, and we also have some a new analysis to add to the manual based on schedule estimating relationships, in addition to cost estimating relationships that I'm going to kind of uh, show you. Uh, if you just want to be notified about updates to the manual, don't really care to submit comments, uh, send your email to info at softwarecost.org, just saying, please put me on your update list. And when we make a major update, um, we won't notify you, for instance, when we make grammatical corrections and, and fix typos. But when we add content, uh, that kind of thing, and change the manual version, we'll send you uh, the link and say the manual now went from version 1.1 you know, to 1.2, that kind of thing. The, the intent of uh, this presentation and, the, and the, all the presentations we're giving now on the manual is to grow it. Uh, the manual was funded by, by DOD. That, that work is over. The manual is now out there. What we'd like to do is make it better, uh, but we'd like to know how to make it better based on what uh, you, you tell us or what direction you, you recommend we go or what you think we're missing. Uh, for instance, there could be better uh, measurement definitions, or maybe we're missing some measurement definitions that need, they need to be included in the manual. Uh, maybe alternative approaches to creating CERs for different software size types, for instance, functional type metrics. We use uh, source lines of code. That's the, the sizing measure that came with the, with the data that we analyzed. But there are other measures out there. Uh, and uh, you know, analyzing those, those um, measures to try to estimate cost is something to be very, very worthwhile. A lot of people don't use uh, source lines of code to, to measure functionality or to measure workload, those kinds of things, that, that stuff which you want to kind of base your, your estimates on. And we're, we're very amenable to expanding the metrics man to include uh, some of those things. Um, we won't be able to provide the analysis ourselves, but we'd be happy to discuss it and then point to a website or to other resources, other places that have that kind of thing. We'd like to make the manual kind of uh, uh, a starting point or a jumping off point where people can go and read about stuff, but that also find uh, point, you know, links to other places that have uh, more information. 
you might also, people might also comment on missing topics. Uh, for instance, what are best estimation methodology practices? We don't really discuss uh, doing an estimate in the manual. That perhaps should be another chapter in there. How would you conduct a, uh, uh, an estimate? What are the, what are the recommended uh, seven steps to doing a methodology for an, or to doing an estimate? Uh, CER accuracy assessment techniques. You know, people use different ways to say my, my CERs uh, meet this criteria, and they throw out these numbers and these letters like uh, MAD and CV and PRED and other kinds of things. You know, what do those mean? Maybe we should have something in here that says, okay, uh, when you rate your, when, when we, you know, look at our accuracy of our CERs, uh, here's what all these things mean, here's how you do them, so that you can reproduce that yourself locally uh, if you do your own CER development. And causes and rates for software growth during development. There's a, something that when you do a cost estimate, uh, you often, often want to do a sensitivity analysis around that. You know, what is the risk of the software uh, amount, software functionality uh, changing? Uh, does it depend on, what does it depend on? Does it depend upon the length of development? Does it depend upon the development domain? That, you know, are there some general kinds of things that might inform the cost estimator uh, why software, you know, how much software goes over um, a development cycle? So if you have some ideas, uh, don't see what you think should be in this manual, please email us with your ideas uh, and drive the wiki content. Use that email address I mentioned earlier, info at softwarecost.org. All right, so let's get on to the um, more interesting part of this presentation. Let me bring up the, the wiki manual. So I've just... Um, opened up my browser and I'm displaying the first page that you get when you type into the address box of your browser softwarecost.org and what it says is main page a uh, little uh, graphic over to the left side there's a sidebar for navigating you can jump around the manual uh, each of these sidebars uh, these these are basically topic uh, or, or you might call them chapters um, we can click on the little uh, uh, pointing arrow the right pointing arrow and you'll get a uh, drop down and this is where these are hot links that can drop can take you right to the particular section in a chapter if there's something in particular that you want to uh, go look at real quick uh, just to see what what the manual says about that particular topic and we're going to kind of go through each one of these chapters and, and do this in more detail also each chapter has at the very top a content so you can jump to a chapter and then you can look at more detailed contents um, because these, these, these headings over on the left-hand sidebar are just basically the level one headings, but in the contents box you have the level two and three headings. You notice that they're, that they're numbered here in chapter one. Each chapter has its own numbering system. When you make a comment about in the manual, make sure you include the reference, you know, in section 1.3, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, this, this is incorrect. You, you know, you should reference so-and-so or go see so-and-so or that kind of thing. You have a, a comment. So this is the main page. Uh, our paragraphs are numbered for referencing. Um, down here, uh, there's uh, a manual contents, which just basically, so I jumped to that. I just clicked on it. Uh, in this manual, we talk about the SRD, which is called the Software Resource Data Report. It's a DOD uh, reporting requirement for certain size projects. We'll discuss in um, in a minute. There's metric definitions, there's data assessment, how we did data assessment, there's cost estimating relationships, CERs, uh, estimating challenges, uh, acronyms, those kinds of things. The next section down is a note for reviewers. So if you kind of forget anything I said about reviewing it, but you know we'd like you to review it, here's on the front page down in section 1.5, uh, talks about uh, that has that email address there again, info at softwarecost.org, and it talks about getting your comments in and then letting us uh, you know, giving us a, a month to respond uh, and fix the, you know, update the manual, that kind of thing, uh, and then send out the update notice to those that, that commented or want to be updated. Part two of this, uh, this chapter is the PDF version of the software metrics uh, manual. This is what the wiki is based upon. It's a PDF manual. Uh, so when you click on the link here, what you do is you go to a download page. It says it's uh, you know 139 pages. It's uh, almost a, a, mega, a megabyte. You know, click here for download. You click and it starts downloading. This gives you an idea of you know it might take a little bit of time to download it. And um, that's basically the hard copy. So if you're more of a hard copy kind of person and, and like to have something to thumb through and mark up, 
uh, go ahead and down, download the manual. Uh, if you find some things you don't like or things that are missing, again, come back to the wiki, uh, send us the info at softwarecost.org, say, hey, you've got, a, you've got a problem or an error you're missing, or would you talk about, or I think you should discuss these kinds of things. We're very interested in, in that conversation. All right, so now that was kind of an overview of the main page. I want to talk about the software resources data report. This is chapter two. And if you click on this link and click overview, uh, you'll come to the next page. Now, I've preloaded these pages in my browser each chapter uh, just because of uh, if, if, if you guys out there are hitting the, hitting the website right now and you're getting slow response times, I, I don't want to have to wait for a page to load, and you have to wait for me to wait for a page to load. So I've got my page preloaded, but these I, I load them from the sidebar here, so you can do the same. The software resources data report, uh, again, is um, this. Department of Defense requirement uh, for um, large contracts to report information about the software development. There is a organization in the Department of Defense, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, called uh, Defense Cost and Resource Center, DCARC. Uh, they, they run out of another program office, CAPE, uh, Cost Analysis and Program Evaluation. You can never fault DOD for not having too many acronyms. Uh, and they basically run this program, and they have a website that describes uh, SRDR as well as some other uh, data collection forms. Uh, CSDR is another, for instance, report. And they keep a repository of these these ref of these forms. So there's a huge number of these forms sitting in their repository. And what we've done is we've uh, used the, the the data in those reports that's in a, in a gigantic spreadsheet uh, to do analysis of. Um, the data to create CERs. An important point that everybody that wants to use data to create cost estimate relationships is uh, what what is the reporting cycle? What kind of data uh, that is, is what, what dates or what events are covered by the scope? Now, for SRDR in particular, they have uh, two kind of major levels of data. One is a contract level report, which is done at con so at the at contract award, for instance. An initial report is made, and then a final report is made at contract award. But within a contract are uh, iterations or builds, and each, the beginning and end of each iteration build uh, uh, has a SRDR report submitted with it. So there's an initial report and a final report. What you want to do, for instance, for, so the caution to, to us when we were analyzing data was to make sure that we were looking at just build level data and not looking at roll up data in the contract award and combining it with build level data. That just increases the variability of the data. So that's a, something we had to pay attention to and something that if you collect data, you need to pay attention to as well. A little bit down the page, uh, SRDR content, there's uh, things like uh, administrative information, where the, where the report came from, what build it's about or contract it's about, um, what they, they can do resubmittals and submission number, things like that. Then there's a development description about the application domains um, and some other information. Then there's a sizing, which is in a source lines of code. And they report sizing in uh, new code, a code that's been modified, and code that was unmodified, or we call it reused code. Then there's a, a resource and schedule reporting, which is um, the effort hours and the um, major activities, for instance, requirements analysis, uh, code unit test, those kinds of activities. They report that. And then there's a quality uh, reporting, which is defects discovered and defects uh, repaired. The, de the, de the quality reporting right now is kind of optional, so we have zero. Uh, information right now on quality, but we're pushing uh, the community to try to please you know, make that non-optional so we can start getting quality measures as well. So unfortunately, in our CDRs, we don't have a, a associated quality measure uh, to go with them. Now, on part six of this, uh, there's a, a spreadsheet. You can actually click on this and get and open up a download Excel spreadsheet and look at the form that's used. Uh, it's a 2011 version that is used to, to report. Um, contractors are not required to, to use this form, but it's there if they want to. Also, there's a list of SRDR data elements. Uh, this is actually part of the wiki. And if you click on that, you get something that looks like this. Uh, it tells you here's the administrative information. Uh, if we go down to program description, you have the application type, where there's POTS, uh, types of you know, staffing levels and things, personnel experience. And then we get into the sizing, um, requirements, volatility, uh, software size, those kinds of things. And um, I mentioned resources schedule, so here are the major events that can be reported. 
you know, the idea of the SRDR is that it's supposed to be tailable. It makes it a little challenging when you do analysis because when people report, when c contractors report different tailor, different uh, activities, you've got to find a way to normalize those and figure out what's the set of activities that is consistent across the, the data records and build your CERs to that. Uh, the other link that's interesting in the SRDR chapter is uh, the CZAC has done some analysis uh, based on SRDR data. And I'm going to see if I can get that to pop up since probably won't be a, there it is, no delay on this one because I'm probably the only person accessing the site. But basically, uh, Tom McGibbon has put up this, uh, and, and his and, and the people at CZAC have put up this um, his website, and you can do you can look at some of the uh, interesting things that are in the SRDR data, kind of some summary stuff, and then some analysis of productivities and size uh, and that kind of thing. So that's there for you to, to go to. And I'll let you do that um, when you when you want to. All right, so that's the metrics definition. It's based on this report uh, data report that's done. Uh, we didn't drive data reports, so the next thing we do is uh, go to a thing called metrics definition. So here we are going to compare, we're going to define measures, and we're going to use those as kind of the standard at which to compare to SRDR data and see, okay, what, uh, what are the differences and, and can we normalize the data to match our definition so we have uh, apples to apples type comparison. So if you click on overview for metrics definitions, You come up to this page, and again, there's a table of contents here at the very top of the page. You can see we talk about source lines of code. Uh, there's all kinds of nuances with source lines of code as a size measure. Then there's functional size measures. Unfortunately, this part needs to be filled out some little bit more. Maybe people out there have Maybe you have some information I can put here, some, some links and things to other places that are more authoritative about talking about these uh, different size measures. And I don't have all the size measures for functions. Um, we're missing story points, for instance, that kind of thing. Development effort, or defi there are definitions for development effort, what you need to be careful there, uh, and, de and duration, development duration. So let's just take a look at the slot counting rules. There are different ways to count a line of code, which are counted in files, basically source code files. We have uh, four, de four definitions here, uh, what's called a logical count. And for the analysis, we've selected logical as our uh, counting type standard. So we convert every other count into logical when we get that. And I'll show you how we do that in a second. There's non commented source statements in CSS. Uh, there is. Um, Physical lines of code, which are basically uh, everything that has a line on it, every 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 line in a in a file that has something on it, and then there's total, which is just every line, whether it's blank or has something on it, it's it's everything. And what we did was we had uh, total counts, NCSS counts, and logical counts, and we had to convert between them. So what this uh, this table shows, table two, is just how. Uh, what, what's included or excluded in an account. And you can see that logical is uh, the most stringent or uh, includes the, the least amount of what I might call non-effort non requiring type of work. And then the CSS has a few more things that uh, it includes that logical does not. And, and finally, total includes everything, uh, X's and all the, all the boxes. Right, so we, we had a challenge in how do we um, how do we take this code and how do we uh, um, fix it? Uh, how do we make everything logical? In the next section, data assessment, I'll show you the, actually the conversions that we did and why we did them. We didn't just do them um, based on what we thought. We actually did a little experiment and got some numbers that we used. Uh, the next topic in, in the next definition is equivalent size. Now, equivalent size is a, is a strange, strange little um, term in that. Like equivalent size is really more of a mythical type uh, measure. It doesn't really, you can't really go out and count, I'm sorry, it's a mythical, si mythical measure called equivalent size. ESLOC, equivalent size, equivalent source lines of code, is something you can't go out and count. It actually consists of counts of different code types, software slot types. Uh, what am I talking about? I'm talking about new slot that was developed, uh, reuse slot, which is slot that was created uh, without change. Modify clock, which, clock, which was used uh, 
that had to be modified. Auto-generated uh, source lines of code uh, converted. Um, there's not really COTS, unless you call it, uh, count COTS blue code. And the volatility uh, that's associated around uh, these code estimates. What we're trying to do with equivalent size measures is make everything to the same, um, make everything the same, all apples. Just as we have to deal with how you count SLOC and make it all the same count type, the second issue is you've got to make it all kind of the same equivalent uh, relative effort per line of code to, to, to use. So what we did is we used the new line of code as the standard and normalized the other types of generated or used code uh, to the new line of code. The way we do that is, uh, in, in this particular uh, announced approach, we uh, use a thing called Adaption Adjustment Factor, AAF. And for the different types of code, for instance, reuse, we would look at um, how much design was modified, how much was code was modified, and how much was integration and test was modified, and put it into this uh, equation. Now, for reuse, uh, what we say is, you know, if it's if you use, if you call code reused, you don't change the design, you don't change the code, you just use it in integration test. And there's some penalty for doing that. And we want to know what, what part of it, did you, did you have to test all the reused code, test part of it, you know, how, what was the percentage? So only I am should have a factor. But now if we change code types to modified code, we would then realize that, yeah, probably the design was changed somewhat, uh, the code was probably modified, and the testing had to go on and how much of that uh, happened in each of these areas uh, to make the code now work in the new application from, um, from where it was adapted for previously existing. We have some definitions here for that. Uh, we have the different uh, uh, equations that you can do for total equivalent size where you're looking at volatility and you're looking at adapted and new and you're adding it all together to get one measure. And again, because it's partial counts of other types of code, it's not something, the equivalent slot is not something you go out and and just count, uh, you, you actually, it's a, a composite of different uh, sources of, of SLOC or sources of code, or new, modified, reused, auto-generated, and the parts of that and aggregate into a one, co one code count that we can then use in our CER formulation. Now, if you're using different measures, function points, use case points, those kinds of things, you know, there are parts of the software that may be reused from other, other applications and if that's the case, then what is that, you know, that, that you might, as with, with SLOC, there may be an impact on the amount of effort it's really required to reuse something from a different application. Therefore, that function point uh, factor that you develop in a CER may be different for function points counted in an in a application that has a certain number of function points compared to a brand new application that, uh, you're, that that's being built. Is maybe you're going to use some part of that other application um, in, its, uh, in its development. All right, these are placeholders here in functional size measures for function points, use case points, and rights objects. And what I'd like to do is put a discussion around this and then uh, pointers off into the, uh, the web sphere uh, for more discussion. The next, besides size, the next thing that's important for the CR development is looking at the uh, other part of the equation, another variable, and that's the effort. And the question is, what's in and what's out? What's included or what's excluded in the development effort you're using to calibrate your model. So um, in our analysis, we included uh, requirements analysis, architecture design, code unit testing, software integration, uh, and system and uh, testing. We left out things like system uh, requirements or system testing, those kinds of things. We focused mainly on the software domain. So, so in order to explain your CERs uh, and what they do, you need to have a table like this that says, here's what the CERs cover, here are the activities that are covered, as well as um, what labor categories are included? Did you, did you include just the programmers and testers? Did you include project managers? How about the people that support development, like quality assurance people and C CM folks, those kinds of things, librarians? Those are other things to consider uh, in de defining your measures and then normalizing things to, um, to your definitions. The last thing is the duration. You know, what, what is the scope or span of the estimate that your CER creates when it tells you it's going to be th these many uh, person months, uh, what's, the, what's the, the, the different time frames that are covered. Uh, you can have the schedule estimating relationships that may say it's, it's 12 months, but what does 12 months cover? Is that from requirements through integration testing? Is it just the coding part and nothing else? You know, what is it that uh, is, is captured inside this duration uh, scope? 
and these this scope is basically uh, the CERs when they're created uh, are created from data that cover a certain development scope. You want to have your all of your data points covering the same uh, scope of development, same duration. Um, and that way, when you pre CER, you know what's what's included in there, and you know what's outside that framework. Now we there's uh, we refer to the Software Engineering Institute's framework for counting staff hours and reporting schedule. There's a there's a pointer here on how to get to it. Also, I think there's a footnote down here that might that I have it. Uh, and those things I think are still available at the SEI website uh, that you can download. And if you haven't ever seen those things, are a very detailed treatment of these topics about schedule duration and uh, sorry schedule duration effort and uh, size. All right, that's that's our measurement definitions. And like I say, we use these then to be the standard against which we uh, base uh, our, uh, or try to normalize our data to the, to the standard. Next is data assessment. This is really preparing data for analysis. So it's, you know, my experience has been um, that the creating of the little estimating equations things, that's, that goes pretty quick. The, the hard part is, you know, deciding what the scope and all that kind of stuff is, and then, you know, processing the data so you can get it all to kind of be homogeneous. That's really where the, the elephant, uh, load or the elephant's weight or the lion's share of the work is in this assessment thing. So let's go over to that by hitting overview. We come to this page. Uh, we talk about a workflow here, gathering data, uh, inspecting each data point, determining quality level of the data, uh, correcting missing or questionable data, and normalizing size and effort, which is really what I want to show you about here. Uh, then we convert raw SLOC to equivalent SLOC uh, from that SLOC equation we used earlier after we've normalized um, the size data and then we adjust for missing effort data. So let's just jump down to uh, normalize size and effort data. What we did was we wanted to use logical SLOC as our standard for a SLOC, for how to count SLOC, and that definition was in the previous chapter. What we had to do is figure out a way to convert these different SLOC counts into a logical count. Now this isn't um, pinpoint accurate, but the, the method technique we used was we went out and we downloaded a lot of public domain software uh, that's available on lightsourceforge.net, and we ran a code counter through the software files and counted up the lines of code. We counted up all, you know, counted the, the different counts: total, logical, NCSS. It all comes out in the line, line, counter, line, line code counter output. Then we can uh, did some graphing, plotting at data points to see. Well, if we counted things uh, using the NCSS count rules. Uh, how does that compare to if we had counted with a slot count rule? So a simple uh, scatter plot relationship diagram. And if I, the nice thing about the wiki is if I if I click on that, what happens is you actually get. I hope this is going to work. You get a the, the picture a more uh, you know blown up kind of view. You can see kind of the size here and and what those um, what the logical and NCSS counts were. Let me go back here. Uh, so we have this, and what we did was we did some analysis and found out that, you know, for the um, the 80 percent rule, um, because we have some outliers out here in, in space, the 80 percent, the lower 80 percent of the sizing, uh, uh, kind of gave you a 0.66 ratio. So uh, 0.66 times a NCSS count will give you the, log the equivalent logical count, and that's how we normalize. We did the same thing for. Um, the total lines, same kind of graph. You can see there's some, some spread out here, so we kind of concentrated on the, the lower sizes. And for that, we came up with a 0.34. So it's about two-thirds and one-third, which to me seems kind of um, kind of penalizing, uh, but this is what we use in our data, and it's, it's helped us to reduce some of the variability in the data. Um, the other thing is um, creating the raw going from lot, the, the, slot, the logical slot count, now we've uh, normalized everything into e, e slot and here's our, our formula, it's new slot plus the AAF for modified, so it has a DM, CM, and IM in here, the AAF for uh, reused, which uh, pay attention to the IM part of the DM, CM, IM factors, and uh, AAF for the auto-generated slot, which are the three slot types that we had to count. If you're missing the DM, CM, and IM values, we did some analysis on uh, the, the records that did have these values for different uh, productivity types, and I'll discuss these productivity types in a second, that's how we segment our data. But we have some recommended values here. We show you uh, the mean and the median because there was some spread and there's a little bit of skewing. 
And you can use these as kind of placeholders until you can collect that information yourself. One controversial point uh, that should be made perhaps uh, added to the wiki, but we'll wait for your suggestions, is you know there are other ways to, to, to uh, calculate ESLOC. Uh, I've seen some very simple formulas, which, uh, uh, which might be better. Um, uh, one is just to take a certain percentage of the modified, a certain percentage of the reuse, a certain percentage of the auto generated, and just leave it at that and take that as a as a good place, a good enough placeholder for an estimate. And if you guys think that's important, please uh, email us at info at softwarecost.org, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, put some numbers out here. And we'd love to cite some other reports of people that have done that. For missing effort data, you know, we have these different uh, activities that we cover, the in and out. What happens if you're missing some data? If it's apparent that that the activity was not done by looking at the the, sort, the explanation around the data, then we won't we wouldn't fill it in. But if you have to go fill data in, missing a percentage of the table of percentages. Uh, the other way this might be used, though, is really as w when these little equations pop out their number of, of person months of effort, for instance. This is a way to, to distribute that effort across these different um, activities uh, during a development. So this could also be used as an effort distribution table uh, for um, distributing the, the CER results. All right, so we processed the data and got it ready. Uh, so now we are done with data assessment. Let's take a quick look at the uh, cost estimated ship overview. Here, another big uh, table. And the things that I wanted to mention was the first thing we did in our CERs, what we did was we decided to, instead of having three or four variables in our equations, we kept it to one variable, just size, to estimate effort, which can then be converted to a cost. We decided to, to group our data into different groups. And there's two groups that we use, uh, operating environments and productivity types. So if you click on this, operating environments, you come down and we describe uh, the different environments that we uh, use for grouping, uh, ground site, ground vehicle, maritime vessel, uh, aerial vehicle, space vehicle, and ordnance vehicle. These are all things that are pretty DOD specific. But we also have a table over here that will uh, describe these in a little more detail. So there's a kind of a you might say it's a reference kind of thing where you can see uh, examples of these uh, different things. Then the other grouping we did was called productivity types. This is somewhat like software application domains. The problem is these domain names that have been used in a number of uh, different studies that I've seen, are all they all sound like systems. So we wanted to get away from that and get into maybe what a software level configuration item uh, might be classified as. So. An avionics system, for instance, might have several different types of these productivity types in there, several different groups of productivity types inside an avionics type application. So you came up with 14 of these, uh, and, the, and the software is classified uh, this way. And this, this too, uh, also has a uh, definitions table here that uh, will give you, you know, deeper, a deeper dive into what we're talking about when we uh, talk about these. So we have a little definition, for instance, uh, centrifugal processing software that requires timing dependent soft, uh, device coding to enhance, transform, filter, convert, and compress data signals. These are example beam controller, sensor uh, receiver transmitter control. Uh, examples are sensors, uh, lasers, radar, sonar, acoustic, those kinds of things. Uh, the, so the software for instance in a radar will not all be uh, signal control and processing software, but there's some part of it that's doing controlling of the, of the actual uh, device that's doing the uh, emissions and re receptions uh, of, of signals. That part we have the SCP uh, type associated with it, but then there's uh, maybe the real-time embedded part in a software, in a, in a uh, radar. We actually do more like uh, gathering the, the signals now and, and correlating them and putting in tracks and all kinds of other information that makes the signal uh, um, understandable and, and usable by the operator. All right, so that's there uh, for our types. Uh, we also went through the mill, the mill standard, the 881C, and we mapped from the environment, sub-system, sub-subsystem into domains. Uh, for instance, the domain is like navigation, communication, IFF, uh, fire control, those kinds of things, and then uh, identify the productivity type associated with that, with that domain. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down here. Um, for the CERs, uh, what we did was we used uh, couple types of equations or forms. One, um, one uh, the first form we used was effort, which is measured as person months, uh, is equal to some kind of 
a constant A times size, which is measured as thousands of equivalent source lines of code, raised to some exponent B. Um, sometimes the data, just look, that, that equation looks squirrely. Uh, we kind of did some looking into the data, and we found that sometimes there's a constant out there associated, kind of a, what you might call an overhead constant. So we also have equations in the form of C being a, an overhead or, or startup constant. Then there's the A times uh, K each block to the B. Uh, sometimes we didn't need the A, so we had the C, the startup constant, and there was no A out here in front of the East lock. So we've had three three forms that we used, and we looked at the here's the uh, the operating environments in this table two, and then the productivity types down the side. Uh, these are the the data that fell into the uh, different buckets. If there was not more than five data points in a bucket, we didn't bother analyzing it. We wanted at least five data points. And then we show uh, what we came up with. So we took this data, we processed it, then we started analyzing it. We divided it up into buckets, then we started analyzing it. And here in 4.3 is uh, ground site operating environment, uh, permission processing. Uh, looks like uh, it's 3.2 plus KE slot to 1.19. Um, there is no R squared. But this is a nonlinear equation, so statistical uh, measures of fit don't don't mat don't. Um, don't apply to here to these equations. There are only six observations. The absolute uh, mean absolute deviation is 0.24. The prediction level pred is 0.83. Um, the minimum maximum value is uh, 15,000 uh, uh, lines of East lock to 91,000 lines of East lock. So we will go through and we do this for a number of um, systems. Then we okay that was ground fixed. Here's ground operating. Then there's ground uh, aerial vehicle. And so on. You can guys can can scroll through that. All the things were reported in the standard that standard format. Next, we also did a productivity number uh, outputs versus inputs, uh, which is uh, thousands of equivalent source lines of code per person month. Uh, and again, another another table of where the, these buckets fit. If, again, if there weren't five or more, we didn't uh, didn't bother doing the analysis. One important thing about this analysis, we did transform all the data up in the previous. Uh, Things. But down here, when you start taking means and standard deviations, uh, the results really are sensitive to whether the data is uh, normally distributed or not. Uh, the mean is uh, the me measures of, of central tendency, such as the mean and the median, or just the mean, um, that measure in particular, the very sensitive. Or the assumption is that the data is normally distributed. In software engineering data like this, where you have size, size can never go below zero, and there tends to be a lot more smaller projects than larger projects. And you, you tend to get a lot of data counts stacked up against zero, which gives you this non-normal uh, graph shown here on the left. What we do is a transform uh, of the data to get a, a normal distribution, and then we, we do our, um, our mean derivation off of this normally distributed data, which shifts uh, where the mean would be compared to this normally distributed uh, non-normal distributed data. So we did that. Um, what I did was I, I, I showed how um, I showed the definitions of these productivity measures. Here's a table that defines what the columns are going to be. I'll show you the table here uh, right now, actually. Here's the table for table five, productivity benchmarks by operating environment. So the environment's over here to the left side. The uh, column headings were defined in the table above. And you have here uh, the mean, the uh, east lock, the, the number of, uh, of observations in that particular uh, operating environment, the min, the max. Um, the lowest confidence interval, the mean, the highest confidence interval. So this would be the central tendency here, uh, 85 uh, KE slot per person month. But it can go as low as 50 and as high as 120. Here's the standard deviation. Here's the cost variance. Um, then over here we have the, the median. So the median for this uh, value is uh, 76 KE slot per person month. And the 25%, the lower 25% of that group, uh, of that ranking of the data, 52 uh, up to 25, 125 to the upper 25 or the 75th percentile, third quartile. This Q1 and Q2, they're all explained in the table above so you can understand that. Then we took a look at, you know, does it really make any difference uh, for these different operating environments? So we have this uh, this graphic, um, and if you, when you click on it, get this picture. And you know, it looks like operating environment really isn't a big differentiator uh, by itself um, between different environments. So maybe this isn't the best grouping mechanism, but we uh, we did this analysis and, and wanted to show it. It probably is a combination. I think in the experience is it's a combination of operating environment and 
productivity type. Let's go back and, and show you what productivity type. Here's the benchmarks of productivity type, same, same table columns, same reporting. You know, anything you see here that's in, that has a, that's in italics, that means um, that they had to be transformed to get that number. The other ones did not require transformation. Uh, some of these did. And we have that same, uh, the same look here of the productivity types. And it looks like there's not a lot of difference between all the productivity types, but you can certainly see that if we look at IIS, Intelligence and Information Systems, and we look at SCP, Sensor Processing Control, there is definitely a difference in the, in the, in the productivity. Uh, some of these other ones, though, they look like they share almost the same productivity with their uh, spread of data about, the me about their median. This is what the box plot is showing in median um, in the upper quartile, lower quartile range. Uh, and so what might make a difference here is, well, mission processing might be different than real-time embedded if uh, we're talking mission processing in the a uh, aerial vehicle environment as opposed to real-time embedded processing in a ground fixed site environment. So, a common, so having a combination of those two may actually be the thing that, that shows that yeah, there sure is there's, there's, there's a difference in productivity. So here we have the operating environment in table seven. We have the operating environment and the productivity type. We go through uh, each combination that we had. Remember, we had to have five or more uh, data points. There are some uh, italics. Uh, that means the data had to be transformed into either um, log log space or sometimes square root, uh, depend upon what the what was required to get it to look uh, normal, and then we um, we did that. So that's that that those are our results. Uh, you guys are free to look at that. Let me just cover one more thing here, and then we'll open up for questions. Modern estimating challenges. Interesting chapter uh, written by Barry Bain um, talks about uh, what you know what faces a a cost estimate when you have all these different types of uh, development methodologies and approaches. So he has a, he's written about rapid change, emergent requirements, evolution development, what does that present as far as challenges, net-centric systems of systems type estimates, uh, model-driven and non-developmental item-intensive development. You know, people are going more to the um, drag and drop or connect lines with a GUI or maybe using MATLAB to produce uh, code. Uh, Ultra-high uh, software systems assurance, how does that impact development? legacy maintenance and brownfield development, uh, K-Ban and uh, Agile. So if we just jump down to legacy, uh, this is... Uh, so different estimating approaches, another, another topic. Uh, this, this, this graphic to me just shows the challenge you have as an estimator, how you have these different um, life cycle processes. There's the waterfall, that's the first uh, one up here, single step. You know, it's, the old uh, inception, uh, rational unified process, inception phase, which is the requirements kind of elicitation, and there's the elaboration where you're going through and doing some maybe prototyping and designing and that kind of thing, and then there's the implementation, the coding phase, um, construction phase, they call it, not coding, sorry, and then there's transition where you're moving it out. Now, usually you don't, uh, you may not um, model um, Inception and transition, you may only model elaboration and construction. Um, that's important to note uh, when you publish your CERs. But then, they, then there's these different techniques to, to you know, put them back to back or to overlap them even, uh, evolution or overlap, where you may be doing requirements or inception type activities all the time, or you may, may do it just once at the very beginning and not do it again. So this is an interesting discussion of that, and these are, these are the kinds of things you see uh, when you start doing estimates for, for cost. And then he has some pros and cons of these different approaches uh, in his um, in his chapter. All right. All right. So that uh, that brings us to basically the end of the overview of the of the manual. Um, there are some appendices. Uh, what we're going to do out here on the on the navigation bar over the right is put the adjudication uh, part of uh, of the manual. Uh, let me just take you over to there. So there's an adjudication page. Uh, let me see if I can get this before anybody else does. I just want to show this to you real quick. Uh, so this is where we want we solicit your comments. Here again, here is the uh, email address and the, the short term, what the cutoff date is, and when we're going to reply. What we're going to do uh, down here is here's the status you'll see is we'll have actually a matrix down here, number three. And the, the matrix will look something like this Excel spreadsheet. It'll, it'll show the comment number, reviewer number. We'll keep your, your name anonymous. 
uh, what, what you were referencing, um, uh, what section, and then what the comment was, and then what we uh, can do about it, then, uh, you know, whether it was, you know, accepted or modified, what the action is, and any remarks about it. So we'll keep uh, people up to date. We'll just keep this matrix uh, growing over time so people can see how the wiki has been modified over time. So we really look forward to your, to your feedback and your input. So I think that's, that's it. Um, if there's any questions, I would love to answer questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brad. Um, it was really, really quite excellent. I appreciate it. One thing I forgot to mention uh, at the beginning is that um, Brad and I have talked about um, also offering this presentation through DCO or Defense Connect Online. Some uh, people have trouble accessing a WebEx event like this, and so uh, we haven't scheduled a date yet, but within the near term, we will try to offer this also through DCO. So if any of you have uh, colleagues that uh, might be were interested but couldn't attend because of the technology issues, um, you can share that with them. Um, now, one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to get your feedback uh, on on this presentation. Um, and so if I can get John to post the um, feedback questionnaire, I'd appreciate it. Um, uh, and let's see, if not, oh, there we go. Sure. And there it is. Um, now, uh, Brad, there haven't been any outside questions. I have a few questions, though. I mean, uh, and uh, one of the questions I have is, what, is, what are you hoping for as next steps after you've completed this manual? Are you trying to put some sort of tools out there for uh, people to use, or, or what, is, what is the thought process there? I think... Um, the thought process right now is um, trying to drive this manual in a way that's, that, that is, um, makes it very useful uh, for people to refer to or to go to, to either read about a definition or to show other people what they're talking about, to explain things, um, also to jump as a jumping off point to other, other sources. We would like to have a tool section in the manual uh, not that the manual will have tools, but we'll, we'll discuss the tool and then point to it. Um, that way people can go over to the tool and they can, they can read about it, and they can go over there and they can, they can play with it or they can use it or they can sign up for it or you know, use it however they, they do. Just like we have the point of the year uh, yes. analysis, we'd like to have the same kinds of things for other resources. We just don't know all the stuff that's out there. Uh, so it's to grow the manual and make it more useful, I think, as overall, and pointing to tools uh, would be great. Uh, Ray and I have talked about... Um, Creating tools, actually Ray has some tools, and we might put some links there in this manual to those tools, but we're not going to really push tools as part of the manual itself, just, you know, cr you know kind of discuss and then, and then point so people can go out and see that. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, I, we now have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so the qu well, first question is, is this cost estimation applicable to um, ERP and other uh, non-ERP type applications? So ERP, no. Um, that, that is something, that's a, that's a, a good question. And um, what we need to do is discuss ERP here. Uh, we could do that at the, in the rice objects. We have that in the, uh, in the sizing, uh, I think it was sizing definitions. And that would be a definite Here we have functional size and here. And it was ERP that I was thinking of when I said rice objects, which is a right. one technique for counting. And you see the dot, dot, dot here. I really wanted to write more about this. And people have done some ERP studies and have published those things in papers. In fact, uh, Wilson Rosa, another contributor to this wiki, uh, has done some ERP modeling and has published results. And if people want more information on ERP, then We'll make a section here about ERP, discuss it, and then we will point them to uh, other resources that, that are out there on the web. I know uh, on this particular topic, I know a couple. Uh, that would be a great, great, another great addition. That's just the kind of thing that we're looking for. You know, where should we, you know, drive this thing? Okay, okay. Um, does the data disting distinguish projects use, using Agile? No. This is a big challenge for DOD. Uh, the, the SRDR is kind of born from the more traditional development process where there, uh, there are these kind of larger activities that d define coding. So for instance, coding and, and unit tests, this particular activity would cover a bit of the Agile stuff, but Agile is more of a lower level, uh, very short cycles, 
uh, where they where they go through a backlog or the requirements for that particular sprint, and sprint being a short duration thing. There's early early uh, looks by the customer. There's maybe early delivery of, of products in. Uh, the SRDR community and the user community, that's one of the things that um, that's a challenge for them. How do we get the, that information reported into the SRDR format? But more than that, how can we, as estimators, gather agile data, do analysis, and, and kind of uh, publish what what is uh, what's useful? Now, the, the agile people do not like source lines of code as, as a um, sizing measure, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm fine with that. Uh, but if it's story points, then what is a story point? How is it defined? And I think right now what I've heard or uh, been exposed to is that story points are something that you need to define consistently, but they may be different, defined slightly differently between organizations. Uh, in the SRDR data, we have these measures that tend to be a little more uniform across uh, organizations so we can gather a large amount of data, whereas the story point uh, might be more local. Uh, I know people are doing, uh, at, they can do agile estimates, but they have their local data. And so the only thing this manual would offer them is, uh, you know, don't forget to define your measures, don't forget to collect them and then normalize them, make sure you can explain the scope and the breadth and depth of your measures, and then, you know, CER development can look like this. It would be, this would be more of a guidebook as to example of how you might take story points in Agile and create estimating relationships. Okay, okay. Um, have you found any correlation between average lines of code to a functional requirement for estimating cost prior to the start of development? We, I've seen, um, for, for functional to line of code, I've seen uh, presentations on number of requirements to estimate lines of code. And the presenters have always concluded that there's a lot of variation um, in, in those uh, CERs or those relationships that they developed. And one of the one of the, the challenges is uh, what level requirement are you counting? Are you counting a, something that's very uh, low level derived requirement of which there's lots of those or are you uh, higher level maybe at a specification, functional specification type requirement? Same with function points. There are function points that are broken up. I've seen tables and uh, you know what, we, we should point to these tables in our, in our wiki that uh, show, well, if you've got a certain language, you've counted a certain amount of, code, of function points, here's been a rule of thumb number that you could use to, for lines of code. And you use that until you can collect your own data because some of these uh, conversion ratios from function to lines of code have a large amount of variation about them, but if you've got nothing, then uh, that's what you can use. So I've, I've seen some of that. But again, there seems to be a lot of variation about going, uh, from going from functional to uh, lines of code. There seems to be either a complexity issue or maybe a language issue in there that you've got to consider when you're doing this uh, conversion. I haven't seen a lot of data uh, I've never seen, I've never had access to data that, that had that. Otherwise, we'd, we'd put that in here. Mm -hmm. But I would be, I think it'd probably be a good idea for us to add uh, pointers at the websites that have these, uh, d that display their, their tables for conversion. So right. Note. Right. Uh, there's a similar question to the Agile question. Somebody was asking about um, uh, models for cloud development. Uh, there's any data in here, any analysis in here related to cloud development? No, unfortunately, no. Uh, there's right. no, nothing for cloud development. Understand, understand. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, this person said he, um, they're very new to estimation, but they were wondering if there's a model to estimate things like estimate the effort required to execute a security gap analysis on an information system. You know, mm. um, very specific question. That that is a kind of. That's the kind of thing you do with data to, to find out, but but this um, this set of measures, of course, does not have that. That particular question is very relevant. However, uh, it, it goes back to the question of can you get the data to, to, to find that out, uh, at least five or six data points to get an idea of what the the effort required to do that would be. Um, mm -hmm. That would be something probably internal, but I've never, and, and I was just at a um, kind of a software assurance meeting last week for, for DOD, and they're they're trying to drill down in that direction for metrics, but that's still a little ways off before they can get some consensus across the communities and what they might collect. But that's a, it's a measure of interest. Uh, I haven't seen any data um, that's available that, that might give an in, in, right. you know, you know, indication. I see. Um, somebody's asking, I, I realize the version of the manual is 0.75. Uh, do you feel it's that far away from being final, or is it, uh, is it pretty final at this point? I would say it's pretty final at that point. At this point. Uh, what we're going to, 
uh, on the adjudication page, and maybe on the previous page too, uh, what Ray and I agreed to was after we, we do this March 15th thing and incorporate uh, all the comments that we've gotten to date, uh, we're going to make it 1.0. The, the, the hard copy manual on, on the main page at the very bottom uh, that you can download, that, that has been approved. Uh, we're just trying to fill in any extra holes that we might have forgotten before we say, well, the wiki's there. Then we want to turn around and go back and update that hard copy. But um, what's here has been approved. Uh, it's just that we'd like to make it a little more. It's, not, it's approved for the DOD agencies that funded us to do it. We'd like to make it this wiki a little more uh, relevant to online users that maybe aren't of the DOD uh, community, maybe uh, they have other other uses for this type of estimating thing, and we'd like to try to address their concerns. So, uh, March 15th, we plan to go with 1.0 because we'll have incorporated the comments uh, by then. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Um, w one of the questions, I guess, is a question I can try to answer. If, if somebody's asking, what's the relationship of this effort to what we've done on CISIAC, and uh, the relationship is somewhat accidental, I think, in in, in nature. Uh, we're we're doing separate things, but we are doing some some collaboration. Um, uh, Brad showed this system, this tool that we call the Software and Systems Cost and Performance Analysis Toolkit, and he had the link in in the in the wiki for that. Um, and uh, so there's uh, we we don't have common funding, you know, but we we are collaborating on on, on this, and uh, so the relationship I think is. I would call it uh, synergistic at this point. Right. So, so, um, let's see, uh, I, I believe that's it. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, there's a comment um, that the data set that was used for this manual allows for the development of SLOC to requirements conversion ratios. So um, that's probably something that uh, that could be uh, could be analyzed. Right, that would be a future analysis. We would probably need there are probably be people that have done that thing for this data set. Uh, if I can find those uh, presentations, if if, if anyone out there knows uh, the the website or the the publication that's available that, that that shows that, I would be glad to put that stuff in here. We'd like to do a chapter on slot growth, and that would be you know kind of based on other people's um, analyses uh, because we don't. We haven't done that. We there are requirements in, uh, that are reported in the SRDR, so you do have that ability to kind of look at requirements, look at the size, and then do a, do some analysis between those two. But we haven't done that. We'd be more than happy to uh, right. showcase that here in the wiki. Right. Uh, do you suppose you could put the slide back up with a web address on it? Uh, yes, Brad. Um, I believe that's what somebody is asking for. A repost of the link for the download. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's the web address, and then the on the first page of the wiki at the very bottom, on the main page, is it says uh, manual hard copy or download the manual, and it has a link in there. You click on that, and then you click on the download link there on the next page, and you'll you'll start downloading the PDF file. Okay, very good. All right, well, Brad, I, I, um, I want to thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Um, it's something, certainly something of interest to me, uh, and um, I, I I thank everybody for, for attending today's uh, webinar. Um, and Brad, thank you again. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay.